I would bet that everybody who is watching this video, so also you right now, has encountered graphene at least once in their lifetime. And the reason is, of course, uh, not because uh, graphene was contained in the coronavirus vaccines, uh, as some conspiracy theorists like to say, because indeed it was not contained, but because uh, you have uh, held graphene, actually many, many layers of graphene, in your hand in the simple form of a pencil. Graphite, indeed, which is the material of which uh, pencils are made, is uh, just a crystal, just a stack of many, many billions and billions of layers of graphene, one on top of the other, and they are held together by exactly the same kind of force that uh, held the Jekyll's feet on the wall. And these are called the Van der Waals forces. One of the ways in which, uh, indeed, graphene is actually produced in a lab is just by taking uh, graphite and uh, scotch tape. And then, uh, using scotch tape, just uh, repeatedly peeling off layer after layer of graphite until we reach a single layer, which is graphene. The main difference is that in a lab, of course, uh, the scotch tape is blue, and actually the graphite that it is used is not of the same kind of the pencil, it's much cleaner and poorer and more uh, ordered with respect to that. But so why bother about graphene in the first place? Well, the reason is that uh, since 2004, when graphene was discovered by physicists Konstantin Novoselov and Andre Geim, who would later win the Nobel Prize in 2010, graphene has shown by experiments extremely extraordinary properties, an extremely high thermal conductivity and also a high electron mobility, so the fact that it can carry current, electrical current for circuits in a very efficient way, it is also very transparent material and one of the strongest material which has ever been measured. And so during the course of these uh, almost 20 years since its discovery, graphene has been thought as the marvelous material of the future with the capability of uh, providing us the material to build uh, extremely flexible and robust and transparent devices. And of course, it has been the object of many, many studies, both experimental and theoretical, by the physicists all around the world. But the actual reason why I'm talking about graphene in this video is because we may have added another piece of the puzzle in order to understand the marvelous properties of graphene. And with we, I'm not talking about a generic we of the whole human race, but a we that includes me, myself, in first person. Because finally, the work of my master thesis on graphene has been published on a very prestigious scientific journal, which is called Physical Review Letters. Probing enhanced electron phonon coupling in graphene by infrared resonance Raman spectroscopy. Well, maybe the title is not the clearest one if you don't work directly in the field of condensed matter physics. But the purpose of this video is actually to try to guide you in understanding, at least uh, overall, what we have done in this work and what we claim and uh, why could this be useful in the future. Well, to understand such a discovery, we need at least to go through three main questions and to answer them. And the first one is, uh, of course, uh, what is graphene? Then the second one is, uh, is there a light that we cannot see with our bare eyes? And then the third one is, uh, how do the constituent of matters uh, interact with this kind of light? I will try to give an answer to these questions uh, in both a non-technical and a technical way, so that both uh, experts uh, or people just passing by and just curious about the topic uh, can at least uh, grasp the flavor of what we have done. And then, of course, I will wait for you down below in the comment section if you have further questions. Fasten your seatbelt and let's start with the first topic. What is graphene? Well, graphene is a single two-dimensional layer, so just a plane, a sheet living in the bigger three-dimensional world of carbon atom, which are arranged as forming a honeycomb structure. Of course, you know that all the matter that surrounds us is made up of atoms, which in turn are constituted by nuclei, which contain protons and neutrons, and electrons, which go around these nuclei. Well, in solid state systems, so in matter which is solid, these atoms are actually arranged in space periodically to form a so-called crystal in which basically there is just a repetition of the disposition of the atoms in a periodic fashion. For those of you who remember their studies in high school, they may remember that actually in the atoms, in the single atoms, the electrons live in so-called orbitals, 
Well, these orbitals, which are just like clouds, in which the electron can be found with a certain probability, become uh, hybridized and they are shared amongst all the atoms in the crystal, so that actually in the end we cannot attribute anymore an electron to an atom. All the electrons are shared commonly by all the atoms in the crystal. So here I just want to show you a microscope picture with a 100 times enlargement of a graphene flake, which me myself had exfoliated, that is the scientific term, when I was back in my master in Rome. And the way in which I did it was exactly with the scotch tape, as I was telling you before. So this microscope picture shows this monolayer flake of graphene, which is more or less 10 or 20 micrometers wide. So it means 10 or 20 thousandths of a millimeter. And actually inside this graphene flake there are many, many, many atoms. If we had to count them, maybe we could count around trillions of atoms, so thousands of billions. The reason why graphene's discovery was such a big deal, and then Novoselov and Gaim got the Nobel Prize, is because before the discovery the great Russian physicist Lev Landau had predicted that it was theoretically impossible to discover a two-dimensional material, to discover graphene in the first place. His argument, of course, were theoretical, and then basically the scientists prove him wrong. So here they come two lessons, and the first of these is for the more experimentalists amongst you. And it is uh, never give up on your ideas. If something is predicted by theory not to exist, well, that's not enough of a reason to give up in trying to discover something new. Physics is an experimental science, and nature is the last judge. And then the second lesson, of course, is something which is shared by all the scientists, and should be shared by all people, actually and uh, it can be synthesized in the famous quote by Carl Sagan. There is, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Exactly, since there was a theoretical argument against the existence of graphene, Novoselov and Gaim had to bring proofs, had to bring facts in order to demonstrate that actually what they had discovered was indeed graphene. Maybe in some Hollywood movies about war, you may have seen these fancy pictures in false color, which depict what is seen with the thermal cameras which are used by the army in order to see in the dark. Well, the way in which these thermal cameras work is actually by detecting light which we cannot see with our bare eyes. The light, indeed, is a wave. Actually, it's also a particle, or if you want, it's a quantum field. But uh, let's talk about waves, uh, first of all. And so, as all the waves, uh, basically it possess uh, a frequency, which is just uh, the number of times that per second this uh, wave oscillates. When we perceive some color with our eyes, actually we are perceiving the frequency of light. Because to frequency, it corresponds a color. And with our eyes, we can see colors that range from red, so from around 400 terahertz, to violet, around 700 terahertz, where terahertz just indicates trillions of times of oscillation in a second. Light which is oscillating faster, and so with a higher frequency than violet, is called ultraviolet, as the name suggests. And it is, for example, the light, part of the light which is emitted by the sun. And actually, since more frequency also means more energy of the light, it is the reason why the UV light of the sun burns us, and the reason why we should always wear sunscreen when we are exposed to the sun. On the other hand, instead, light which oscillates with a frequency lower than the red is called the infrared. So it is still light that we cannot see, but much less energetic than the red color. It is this kind of light which is detected by the thermal cameras. And the reason is that basically every body, so also the human body, of all the matter, actually emits light with a frequency, with a color, which depends on its temperature. So for example, our body, which is, uh, if we don't have fever, at uh, around 36.5 degrees Celsius, emits light of a color which is in the infrared. The sun, which has a temperature of around 5,000 degrees Celsius, is the surface temperature, emits light which we can see with our eyes. And also a flame, for example, on the stove, which is at around 1,000 degrees Celsius, emits light which we can see. So the moral of the story is basically that we wanted to use this infrared light in our experiment since uh, this light has a very low 
energy. And with uh, this low energy light, we can actually interact with the low energy electrons in graphene. And among the fancy properties of graphene, there is the fact that the low energy electrons behave as if they were massless particles. And so what we do, what we have done indeed, is the so-called Raman spectroscopy, which just means that basically we are shooting light, in particular infrared light, to graphene, and then we observe what is the color of the light which is coming out with an instrument which is called the interferometer. And by studying what is the color, basically we can deduce what is the energy that has been left by the light in the graphene. And so study what is the interaction of the electrons with the light. What have I done? Well, I've just excited some phonons inside this material. As we were saying before, everything solid, every solid state system, is just a bunch of atoms which are organized in a crystal. And uh, of course this crystal, this lattice, can vibrate because I punch it or because the atoms in the crystal just like to wiggle a bit just because they are at a certain temperature and the higher the temperature, the higher the amount of oscillations that they will do. Phonons is just a term that is used in order to describe in a quantum mechanical way these uh, vibrations and it comes actually from the Greek word for sound because as you have heard if I punch something, if I make it vibrate, well then that will carry some sound. Light cannot directly interact with these vibrations, it needs before to be absorbed by the electrons and then the electrons somehow will interact with these vibrations of the crystal lattice via a mechanism which is called as the electron-phonon coupling, which is just a fancy way to say that the electrons interact with the vibrations. Well, in our experiments we were interested in particular in one of the vibrations of the graphene honeycomb structure, which is called the breathing mode of graphene. And so finally we can wrap it up and understand what was the meaning of the long title that I was reading before by using this light which we cannot see, this infrared light, we have done Raman spectroscopy, which is just the way of saying that we shoot light to graphene and then we observe the color which is coming out, in order to study what are these vibrations. And since these vibrations can only happen when electron couple to this vibration, then we have a clear indication of what is the electron-phonon coupling in graphene. What we have discovered, and basically here it was the secret and the piece of the puzzle that we added, is that this electron phonon coupling is greatly enhanced, becomes very very strong when we consider low energy electrons interacting with the phonons, with the vibrations that are described by this breathing mode of the crystal lattice. Ultimately, the interaction between the electrons and the lattice vibrations affects the way in which the electron can travel inside graphene. And so, for example, if you want to make devices in which a current can flow, since the current is carried by the electrons, which are the charge carriers, well, we have to consider how they interact with the lattice vibration and to know that these vibrations couple to the electrons in a very strong way the, this enhanced electron phonon coupling, well, it means that uh, we need to consider how they are slowed down by this interaction. To see this result published, we needed two more years of investigation after the work that I have done in my master thesis. As you may remember, because I published a video back then, I graduated in physics in Rome in July 2021 and then the article got finally published on Physical Review Letters in June 2023. Of course all this work was needed because we needed to bring evidence, to bring proof of the fact that this electron phonon coupling is so strongly enhanced. And this is something that, as I was saying before, is true for all aspects of science. You need to convince your peers, you need to convince other scientists and the whole community in the world that what you are doing is indeed correct. Part of my thesis indeed was not only performing measurements, but also doing theoretical calculations and simulations in order to understand what was going on, to compare with theory and to claim that uh, what we were seeing was indeed something true. 
Here it comes the last thing that I wanted to say in this video and uh, I hope uh, with uh, this uh, kind of explanation I cleared a bit uh, the fog around the term of graphene because uh, many many conspiracy theorists uh, claim uh, that this graphene can harm us uh, or that we can find it in uh, some extremely weird places but actually as we have discussed uh, is nothing particularly harmful. Well, my hope is that the next time that you will hear some bullshit from these conspiracy theorists, you will remember my word and uh, go to them and say that they are wrong. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope I made myself clear. And of course, as I was saying, I wait for you in the comments for all your questions. And then there is the moment of the acknowledgements because of course this work could have never been possible without the people that led me through this journey. And then of course I want to thank my former supervisor, Professor Leonetta Baldassarre and Professor Francesco Mauri, and then Dr. Tommaso Venanzi and Dr. Francesco Macheda, who had led me and showed me and taught me a lot of things about physics which I didn't know before. And of course I think in my path to become one day a scientist, of course they had a very, very great influence. And then I want also to thank my great friend Simone Soggio, who performed part of the measurements with me back in the time in which I was uh, in Rome. And I also want to thank you for having reached this point in the video. I hope you liked it, share it with your friends, and we will see you to the next video.